The Real Show is brought to you by UCS Facility Management Limited, Omni Basic Bank, and Dewdrop Hand Sanitizer. Welcome back to The Real Show. If you just joined us, then welcome because you are about to get a lot of information that would inspire you. This is the most sought after Friday night show. And my guest is Elizabeth Irene Beatty. Let's have a look at her introductory video. Clinical biochemistry helps to diagnose and manage diseases through the analysis of blood, urine, and other body fluids. This is done by producing and validating the results of chemical and biochemical analysis. Clinical biochemists are usually based in hospital and some work privately as chemical pathology laboratories and some work privately at chemical pathology laboratories. They advise physicians and general practitioners on the appropriate use of tests, interpretation of results, and the follow-up investigations that may be required. They develop new and existing tests, which is often automated and computer-assisted, but sometimes requiring considerable manual expertise. They also work outside the laboratory to support the investigation of patients at the point of care, including clinics and operating theatres. Elizabeth Irene Beatty is a clinical biochemist and a director of Patholab Solutions Medical Laboratory, which she founded in the year 2000. It has branches in Adabraka and Kaswa and offers medical laboratory services to the general public, medical facilities, laboratories, schools and factories. Patholab also provides wellness screening services to corporate bodies and institutions. Elizabeth Irene has always loved the literary arts and she began writing fiction for children and young adults in the early 2000s. To date, she has had seven books published, several of which received literary awards such as the Macmillan Writers Prize for Africa and the Burt Award for, for African Young Adult Literature. Her books include A Saint in Brown Sandals, Twelve Heart and The Lion's Whisper. Her most recent book, Crossing the Stream has been published in the USA this year and has received start reviews from the book critiques Kirkus and Publishers Weekly. Welcome, Irene. Welcome, welcome, welcome. I love the print dress and I love your hair. Thank you, Mahalia. I love your dress as well. Thank you. You're going to have to tell us how you <laughs> came about this texture. Like, it looks beautiful. Yes, my hair is actually the result of a lot of leave-in conditioner, which happily I can find here, okay. and Eco Styler Gel. That has been oh, a savior. Oh, that is great. Yes, what, what I do is I wash my hair and put lots of leave-in conditioner in, and then just brush um, Eco Styler Gel in. My hair is very kinky, and it just coils up in its natural coil pattern and stays like that. Oh, you heard it here <laughs> on The Real Show. So if you have your kinky, I think, 4C texture hair, 4C. just like hairs, you can do that too, right? <laughs> you heard it right here, nowhere else. <laughs> and you look so young. I mean, if you watch the introductory video, you would know that the Patholab, Patholab. is over 20 years. That's right. So that means right. you look way younger than you probably are. <laughs> Thank is there you. any secret Thank right you. there you can share? I would say... It's a lot to do with what you eat, how okay. much you eat, and the way you live your life. Obviously, there are some things that we can't always control, but what we can control, what we eat, and how we live. And I like to, I like sweet things. I have such a sweet tooth. Oh, really? Oh, honestly, I have such a <laughs> sweet tooth. But I, I do understand that it's important to eat well. So I will eat my vegetables. I will not eat too much in terms of carbohydrate, and I will exercise. And, and try and get some sleep. I think those are, and then maybe yeah. just try and stay happy as well. <laughs> That's helpful. Not That's let uh, Not let too many negative thoughts bother you because what you feel inside, I think, begins to reflect on, on the, the outside, outside as well. So just staying as happy as we can be. So well, there you have it. <laughs> Tips, bits to look good and have great kinky hair. <laughs> <laughs> so tell us about your educational background. I have, I started um, in Christ the King. Mm. I, feel, I, feel, I feel I probably had the best primary education there. Mm. And then went to Achimoto <laughs> School, where I think I had probably the best seven years of my life. 
Wow. I was with my classmates this evening. We we're talking about form one. Form one was a complete nightmare. But from form two <laughs> onwards, I think I, I learned a lot, made a lot of great friends, and, and, and was also introduced to a wide range of subjects. I was the sort of child who was always reading. And the only thing I could ever see myself being in future was an author, a book, a book, um, yeah. a book author. But um, I began studying the sciences in Achimata School, found that I enjoyed them and did reasonably well. So I went on to the University of Ghana, where I studied for, I studied biochemistry and chemistry, and then went to do my master's in clinical biochemistry with molecular biology. Wow. <laughs> That's very impressive. <laughs> now, um, tell us about Patholab. I mean, it's been over 20 years. Yeah. How did you maintain the business? You even have branches. Tell us about that. Patholab, I started Patholab when I was just turning 30, 20 years ago. I'm 51 mm -hmm. now. And um, I started it as a, a, a small laboratory offering services, clinical laboratory services, medical laboratory testing services mm -hmm. to the public. Anybody wants to walk in and check um, your cholesterol levels, liver function tests and so forth, we are there for you. Yeah. We also offer that service to clinics, we offer it to hospitals, because a lot of uh, medical facilities may have a laboratory but may not be able to run every single test. So we pick up what they are unable to do and we also look after companies. Some companies mm -hmm. are interested in running wellness screening for their staff just to make sure everybody's well, everybody mm -hmm. understands what to do to stay well. And uh, we started off as a staff strength of five. There are 31 of us now. Wow. And uh, we've, we've grown gradually but steadily over the years. Great. But why clinical biochemistry? Why um, not anything else? I, I know that's an interesting one because <laughs> probably at the age of about 15 or 16, I, I, I would not have been able to tell you what clinical biochemistry <laughs> was. But you, you sort of evolve in a in certain so direction. And although at the age of about 14, if anybody had asked me, I'd have said, I'll probably do literature because I loved, the li I loved literature. <laughs> I, I found that I did enjoy the sciences. And by the time I was getting into university, I had decided that I wanted to go into clinical biochemistry. It's, uh, it's, it's strange, but the thought just began to grow in my head. And um, I just worked towards that. Okay. Well, how, how is your daily routine at work like? I mean, if you wake up in the morning, how, because you know, most people don't know how, um, for instance, if I should go to the hospital, mm -hmm. I expect that somebody should be seated to attend to me. We mm -hmm. don't usually think about the fact that they have lives, <laughs> you know? So I we understand. sort of want to understand how your day goes, yes. you know? It's a lot of teamwork. Mm -hmm. It's a lot of teamwork. It's getting a group of people with the talents and the commitment to work with you to mm -hmm. ensure that you achieve the aims of the and the objectives of the company, which is to provide quality medical laboratory service. So my typical day starts early. I'm an early riser. I tend to be full of nervous energy in the morning. <laughs> so start my day early, get to work by about 7.15, and the lab opens at 7, so there will be somebody present. We work on a shift. So oh, okay. you come in early, and then you leave probably at about 3 o'clock or so. Somebody comes in later and covers. My typical day will be to ensure that um, we've met our targets for the day before, all the reports that have come in have been sent out, all quality control measures have been, at, have been maintained. Of course, there are, there are qualified personnel in place to ensure that all of this goes on. But as the laboratory director, I need to oversee everything and make sure that all our systems and processes are working. So it means communicating with each arm of the laboratory, from technical, administrative, and wow. so forth. Just making sure that all the cogs of the wheel are oiled and everything is moving smoothly. Well, are you the See? sole owner of Patholab? I am. I am the owner of Patholab. Yes, but I do have directors on the, at the board level. Yes. Oh, okay. Because mm. you keep referring to yourself as a director, as a director, as a laboratory director. Yes. yes. So I am the laboratory director, okay. but I am also a director on the board of the company. Huh. Mm. Okay. I think mm. that's clear <laughs> now. <laughs> but how do you maintain? Patholab, I mean, how did you maintain your business running for these 20 years yes. and even more? Yes. What's the secret? What do you do different? Are there times you feel like giving up? 
at the times you have the feelings we get to always been smooth. How is it? I get the feelings everybody else gets. <laughs> I remember one of my friends was starting a business and I told him, get ready for those panic attacks. It's it it can be it can be a very undulating journey. Sometimes things go smoothly and sometimes there are real challenges. There are challenges which we, I, I face just as much as any other business. Yeah. And over the last 20 years, what I have learned is that the tough times don't last. You've got to be tougher than the tough times. And, and yeah. I rely on, of course I trust in my God, but I, li I rely on the encouragements that I see in success stories around me and in the team that I have I have a, a resilient and dependable team, which always makes a difference. The people you work with make a very big difference on your outlook and the general direction you want to go. You have to have like-minded people working with you, people who understand the value of a quality service, who have bought into it and are willing to do what it takes to deliver a quality service. So I would say to maintain a business for 21 years, you must have faith Faith in God, faith in yourself, resilience, and a great team. You need a great team to move forward. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's a saying that if you want to go fast, you go alone. But yes. if you want to go far, yes. you go with others. Honestly, honestly. And um, that's one thing I have begun to value more and more. With every passing year, I begin to value the diversity I have with my team at work and what each person is bringing to the table because you can't do everything. I, I certainly can't do everything. <laughs> so I, I'm grateful to have a good team. Well, teamwork mm -hmm. makes the dream work. It does. And <laughs> I'm glad you have Hamid on that. Mm -hmm. Now, from, I mean, we are still facing COVID, yes. but when the pandemic hit us freshly till now, mm -hmm. how has the impact been on your business and how have you managed that? Right in the, at the beginning, it was quite challenging, mm -hmm. mainly because a lot of people were not working. A good number of people had to stay home and so forth. Mm. So there generally was not that much traffic or movement. Yeah. And people were scared to move around. <laughs> that, that, that reluctance to go anywhere showed in our business as much as it did anywhere else. So things were quiet for a couple of months. But mm. then COVID also comes with the fact that more people then become worried about their health and will will then come and check certain aspects. So as people began to step out of their homes, they would often come to the laboratory to do, whether on their doctor's advice or of, of their own volition, come and check to make mm -hmm. sure that everything was fine. So what, how about your workers, those who were able to come to work during that period? Did you have like periodic checks or something of the sort? You we did. We, we did have periodic checks <laughs> and we needed them. We did. Even now, we still do have periodic checks. Oh, Our work is such that it, it puts us directly in line with people who may be carrying the COVID-19 yes. virus. Yes. And um, you just need to be sure at all times that everybody is safe because one person gets it, it affects the whole team. So mm. we do carry out our checks. Mm. So you have other branches, yeah, one at Kaswa and the other? In a, the main branch is in Adabraka. Adabraka. Yes, that's where we started in 2000. Okay. And we, 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 want, we needed to grow, we wanted to grow. So mm. we found uh, another location in Kaswa beside the polyclinic. And that's, that's a, it's a small branch, but it's also very busy. And we work in tandem, we work together. Mm. Now that brings the question, how do you manage your workers? I mean, we have managers of businesses and all of that, but uh, we are still in a, in a space where, or time where, when you're a woman handling a business and it's that successful, people wonder, especially when you have a family, there are other things you do, you're even an author and all of that. So how are you able to manage your staff throughout you know, the different phases of businesses? It's managing staff, it's just same as managing people. Mm -hmm. It would be the same as being in a, a, within a family setting, mm -hmm. managing the different personality types you have, mm -hmm. understanding that each person is unique, each person is bringing something different, mm -hmm. understanding the value of that person and getting the person to understand their value as well. Mm -hmm. Because when you understand your worth, you raise your game the way in which you behave towards your work and act towards your colleagues 
is also impacted yeah. because of the your understanding of who you are and what you are bringing to the company. Mm -hmm. So largely with my team, I like my, my staff to understand that each one of them is valuable and each person's work is important. If your job was not important, you would not be there. And, and constantly reinforcing this, I, my leadership style is not, um, I, I, I tend to lead with, move with my people, with my team. So we, 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 we grow together, we grow together. And yeah. it's, uh, I think as human beings, we often need to be reminded about things. <laughs> At years ago, I used to think once somebody has been told something once or information has been given, that's it. You don't need to reinforce it. Yeah. But we, we do need to reinforce that. So mm -hmm. constantly bringing to fore the, the, the tenets of the company, our vision, our mission, Everybody buys into it, everybody understands it. We have regular meetings and we understand what each person is bringing and that, that helps. That is great. I will take notes of that <laughs> if I'm running my business as well. And you, you being in the medical uh, industry or segment, I would like to know, you know, usually people do not care much about um, certain diseases unless there's a lot of noise about, like there was a time there was a lot of noise about um, HIV AIDS and then COVID came and the attention was on COVID. So all the time it's like when there's a pandemic or there's a rise in the numbers of a particular infection or disease, then there's a lot of noise about it. So you being somebody who runs uh, a lab and she gets to come into contact with people, you know the results of the tests they do and all of that, what would you say is some of the diseases that are rampant now in the system? Aside the fact that we are all afraid of COVID and we are watching COVID, what else do you think people should look out for and protect themselves against? You know, there's a saying, common things are common. Yeah. It's been the same story for a good number of years. Okay. The same cases we have, cardiovascular disease is a leading killer worldwide. Wow. Now, cardiovascular disease is a disease of the heart and, and just generally yeah. of the, the blood vessels. That is largely driven, not entirely, but largely driven by our lifestyles. Okay. So the way we eat and how much we are eating, we forget that we were not meant to eat, 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 eat. Food is so readily available now that people think it's normal to have a huge meal in the morning, huge meal in the afternoon, huge meal in the evening. It's not. Back in the day, when I say back in the day, I'm talking about three, four, five hundred years ago, you would, even to make yourself a pot of soup, you'd have to go out, hunt for some tomatoes, which the birds <laughs> yeah. are looking for as well, hunt for some leaves and roots, and you're not the only person looking for them. All the animals are looking for that sort of nourishment as well. If you were going to have meat, you'd have to run after an antelope for about three days or two days, because the antelope doesn't want to be caught. <laughs> so generally, generally, the practice of getting food onto your table was so energy intensive. You would yeah. have to expend energy. Right now, you can just tap on your phone and um, big bowl of greasy food has been put in front of you and the restaurant decides this is a portion perhaps the size of this bowl of potpourri is a portion of jollof rice and you think that's a portion so you eat it so we people are getting becoming so unhealthy because we're eating a lot and we're not expending enough energy very few people are spending as much energy as we would have about 300 years mm -hmm. ago we are walking less you sit down more you take a ride you don't do as much manual labor so Cardiovascular disease is one of the biggest diseases affecting us, and that, that is on the increase. Okay. And you see it in younger people, because I do. Oh, wow. Yes, you do. It's even over the relatively short time of 21 years, I have noticed a change in the sort of results I would see in a 28-year-old person in 2002 and a 28-year-old person in 2001. And, mm -hmm. and frankly, it's quite shocking in terms of blood pressure, weight, um, certain markers of disease, like especially the cholesterol levels, mm -hmm. for example, some of them can be very disturbing. So we need to drive home the message. We're eating too much, we're not moving enough, and we're eating a lot of the wrong kinds of food. It's okay to have fried rice once in a while. I have a very sweet tooth, but it's a, it would be a bad idea to eat a big bowl of ice cream or three bars of chocolate a day. But it's available, so people eat them. <laughs> and. Uh, concept of what is normal has changed. Even clothing size has changed. When I was in Achimoto school, I was a dress size 12. I am bigger now than I was in Achimoto school. Why am I almost a dress size 10? 
because the manufacturing industry, the clothing industry, have changed their sizes. Oh. They have put smaller labels on bigger sizes just to make people feel happier. So our mindsets have, <laughs> have Interesting. not... Interesting. Yes, do not, not accommodate the fact that we're all getting bigger, we are not all not eating as, as mm. well as we should. So cardiovascular disease, that's the biggest problem that wow. we are facing, yes. And the fact is, there's blood pressure, which is often, it often runs in family, but it's also linked to your lifestyle to mm. a large extent. Cholesterol levels, a sedentary lifestyle, not doing anything, go to the office, you're sitting behind your desk the whole day, come back home, you're sitting behind your laptop watching something on YouTube. It's, uh, it, it's telling on our health, it is. That's, that's one of the biggest problems we see now, cardiovascular disease and the markers that indicates cardiovascular disease. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm so glad, I'm so, so glad that you brought this up. Most mm -hmm. of us think, I usually always think, no, usually always think that it's the HIV, it's probably the breast cancer, it's, you no, know, something that, that, that's, that's that alarming. Well. Yes, yes, there is, yes. but it looks like what's basic with our lifestyle and uh, our health, absolutely. the engine of the body, the heart. Absolutely. We do not even pay attention absolutely. to it. Absolutely, absolutely. Wow. Yes, it, and it's something I believe should probably be hammered on probably from about early secondary school age because those habits begin to form early. Mm. It's very interesting. You go to a company, there's a young university graduate who's just started, 23 years old, he's nice and skinny and about, <laughs> and you keep going because we do corporate wellness screening, you keep going back every year and every year he's getting heavier and, and, yeah. and you think, guy, what's going on? Wow. Thank you yeah. so much for alerting us <laughs> to not forget to take more uh, time and pay attention to our lifestyle. Eat less. And take care of our eat cardiovascular yes. health. Absolutely. Thank eat you less, move more. Eat less, move, move more. more. I'm going to yes. eat less and move <laughs> more. <laughs> so um, let's look at the fact that you are a biochemist by day, mm -hmm. but an alpha by night. And that is so refreshing. <laughs> Most of the time people think if you get into the medical field, you cannot do other things that you love, but you are an alpha. And you've written several amazing books. And we will get to that, but let's have an... A look at this video about her authorship or writing and then she will tell us more about that side of her. 50 years ago on the 20th of August 1970 I began my journey walking through life one step at a time. Each day has brought its own lessons. There have been easy strolls, uphill struggles and obstacles. Painful, dull or joyful they have all been part of the road. I've learned to walk in trust and in faith. The beautiful thing is, God never intended us to walk alone, and I have found him in human form all around me. I have found him in you, my loved ones, my family, nuclear and extended, my friends, my colleagues at work in social and professional circles. You have walked with me in sunshine and rain. You've kept me company over the long dry roads, held my hand over tricky terrain, supported me over the bumps, encouraged me to take that leap, cross that bridge, climb that hill. You've stood with me at the stop signs of life. You've been at the crossroads, advising, go straight ahead, turn right here, wait. You've been the wind at my back, kept the sun on my face.
you have shared your journeys with me. You told me how you made it. Welcome back to The Real Show. If you just joined us, we were having a very interesting, informative and educative conversation with Elizabeth Irene Beatty. And we are about to talk about the fact that she's an author as well. And I am very, very excited because, like I said before we went on break, most people think when you get into the medical field, you cannot really do other things that you love. But you are an author. Tell us about that. What inspired you to write? I, th I mentioned earlier that the only thing I imagined myself doing when I was little yes. was to be an author. Oh, okay. I loved books. <laughs> I was the sort of child who, in the classroom, it, especially in Christ the King, my friends would stop lending me books because I'll see a story. We're gonna, I had to have it. Can I have it? And then, of course, I'll be reading it during the math lesson or geography lesson. The teacher would notice I didn't, he didn't have my attention and come and confiscate the book. And that'll be the end of the book to the end of term. So my friends would say, oh, we're not going to lend you a book. You read it and the teacher would confiscate it. So it was, it was always in me. My dad supplied me with books. I read books. I enjoyed them. And I wanted to create the kind of books that I enjoyed reading as a child. But you grow up and you discover other things. Mm -hmm. I discovered the sciences. I discovered biology, physics, chemistry. I discovered clinical biochemistry. But, but that love never goes away. You know, it's, it's, it's almost like you have two boyfriends. You, know, and you can't <laughs> choose. <laughs> You're confused. You can't, yes, you can't choose between the two. And uh, while my career as a clinical biochemist, a laboratory director, and in a medical laboratory is quite demanding, I will also have no peace if I do not write because there is a desire in me to write and keep writing, which I must fulfill. So <laughs> I run the laboratory during the day, I take my walk in the early evening, get home, mix with my family a bit, and then I go and do my writing. It's challenging. I will not for one moment tell anybody it's easy. It's not. Sometimes I'm so tired, Mahalia. I sit, <laughs> <laughs> I sit behind my laptop. I tell my husband, Mommy Charlie, I'm tired. Aww. I'm tired. And then I add, but the book is not going to write itself. So it is challenging. There's nothing easy about it. Nothing. But I tell myself, one word at a time, mm -hmm. the story comes out. Yeah. So what inspires you to write the books that you have been writing so far? I mean, apart from the fact that you said you're writing from uh, some of the things you discover and you're trying to recreate books that you loved to read mm -hmm. as a child. Because mm -hmm. you said growing up, you've discovered other things that you want to write about. So what are some of the things that in your discovery as an adult, way from when you were younger and what you used to read, what are some of the things that are inspiring you to write? My, my, stories, my stories generally explore the heart in different ways. I write for children and young adults, but there's a lot in my stories about, my, mine are largely character-driven stories. The, the confusion that you feel within you, the desire to follow a certain path, which may or may not be the right path. The, I, I explore the choices you have to make as a young person, whether you're a child or whether you're older. I explore facing your fear because that's something that is an ongoing thing in life. And you discover quite early, there, there may be little things that you are scared of, but fear never goes away. It's always there. And at every stage of your life, you're trying to learn how to conquer fear. So I explore that. I, I generally explore what is going on. And my inspiration comes from everything I see, everything <laughs> I hear. I mean, you might inspire me to write. Oh, I hope I do. <laughs> to, write, yes, <laughs> to write a story. And, and, and why do I choose to write? Bec uh, it will be the same as wondering why somebody chooses to sing or dance. Or you, you, The Lord himself plants different abilities and desires within us. And he planted the desire to write with it. I, I must write. <laughs> so everything is a seed for a story. I have little notes. I hear something interesting. I make little notes somewhere. And, 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 and the story will wrap itself around that little seed, that little kernel. It grows. It grows, and <laughs> yes, it's, it's largely my desire to explore the, the human soul, the growth that, we, that comes about as a result of the challenges we face. So all my characters face challenges, <laughs> all of them face challenges, and they are usually challenges that, are, that require them to grow. Okay. Great. Tell us about some of the books you've written, and do you have a favorite? I'd love to know. <laughs> Uh, the very first story was, the fir first book 
The Saint in Brown Sandals, that won the Macmillan Writers' Prize for Africa in 2006. It's, it, that's pretty dear to my heart. Oh. <laughs> and it's, it explores an 11-year-old writing a diary. And when you are very young, and perhaps even as you get older, there is a desire to fit in. There is a desire for people to see you a certain way, perhaps looking brighter and shinier than you actually are. And this, this, my, my young protagonist has to decide between being herself and being somebody else just because she wants to be more popular. And that is something that I explore, not just in that, but in my first young adult's book, The Twelfth Heart. And I would say The Twelfth Heart is probably the story that's closest to my Aww. heart. <laughs> and probably the story that's closest to a lot of my readers' hearts as well. It is the book I get questioned about most often there is some sadness in the book but there's a lot of there's a lot of fun as well there's a lot of naughtiness my main character is 15 years old she's come from a dull dry dreary town she's moved to boarding school she wants to make sure she has the right friends it's with the right group she doesn't want anybody who is dull or who's going to pull her rankings down <laughs> would you the say your experience in uh, Achimota school sort of helped you or you pick some experiences from there into the book? I pick my experiences, my stories, everything comes from what I see, what I hear, not just in my life but in the lives of people oh, I yes. know or even something that I hear about or something I read about. It's, it's a whole mix of things and there will always be that underlying, I, I call it the kernel or the seed, which is truth and then I, I, I create a story around it. So a large part of it is based on things that have happened, happened before. Mm -hmm. So apart from the boarding school, any other, maybe your second favorite? Um, the, the boarding school series, that was a, a set of three books. Okay. And in, in each book, my main character, she keeps making mistakes. And sometimes readers ask me, why does she keep doing these things? <laughs> because she's human. <laughs> Nobody <laughs> stops making mistakes. Uh, so beyond that, um, there is The Lion's Whisper, which is my first book with a boy as a main character. And that was set in 1979, which was a very traumatic mm -hmm. time for me. 1979 was the time of Rawlings' coup. I was mm -hmm. eight years old at the time, and it was the first time I had experienced or heard, heard or seen the horrors that come about with a military coup. I had friends in the classroom who just stopped coming to school. I just never saw them again because wow. their fathers had had to flee the country. I had friends whose fathers were executed. I, I saw bullet buildings pockmarked with bullets. I heard gunshots. I, I saw pictures of executed senior army officers. It was very traumatic for me. Extremely so. And as I grew up, I knew I had to write about it. So in The Lion's Whisper, I set that as a background. I have a main character who is indirectly affected by the, by the coup initially and then as time goes on because something happens and it seems to be quite far away. And then before you realize it, it's right on your doorstep. And my main character has to flee the country. But in the course of the story, he also has to find courage to face his fears. He has to find courage to bridge a, a, a gap in relationship between his family and that of another family. A lot goes on and it's all set against this tumultuous, terrifying backdrop of a military coup. That, that I, I felt myself pouring my soul out onto the paper when I was writing that, even though I was not directly affected by the coup. Okay. So that is, um, that's another favorite of mine. Mm -hmm. I have to read that. <laughs> the Lion, The Lion's Whisper. whisper. Mm -hmm. How do people get your books to read? My books are, most of them are available in Ghana. Um, EPP, Videos Bookshop, uh, Kingdom Books, I know has got them. Book Nook has got them as well. My, la my latest book, Crossing the Stream, was published in the USA. I have been fortunate enough to be signed on by a literary agent who wanted to take my work abroad. Really? And the first, my first book to be published outside is Crossing the Stream. Uh, I'm happy to say it's got some very good reviews, so I'm oh. grateful for that. So that is currently available on Amazon and in the US. 
but the others are all available locally. Okay, but the others can be online as well, right? You can have access the, to the them others, online. Uh, uh, some of them are online, not all of them. Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you so much for sharing all of that with mm -hmm. us. Now, let's look at your personal life. Mm -hmm. You are an achiever. Running a business this long alone, I mean, that's a legend telling you. I mean, with economic crisis and things rising up and down, you held your business down and you've even opened another branch in over 20 years. You're a writer, your books are selling abroad. You are a woman of substance. That's tonight's message to my viewers. You are a powerful woman of substance and a source of inspiration to the young generation. And I'm honored to have you here. Thank but you. one would wonder, most of the time, or most of the times, we think that you'd have to choose between having your career, um, following your passion, this of us are as opposed to choosing a family, but you have both. You have a family, you have your business, and you have your other passionate thing, which is the writing. How do you juggle all that? What is the secret? The secret is having help. Truthfully, the secret is having help. I simply could not do this on my own. From when my children were little, I was blessed and fortunate enough to have family, my mom, my sister, my in-laws, people who help, and then having domestic help as well, because at the end of the day, you get home and you're tired. When, when my children were younger, it was a more hands-on approach. It was more tiring, but even then, I realized I couldn't do it by myself. I would always have somebody in the house to help me. Otherwise, how else would I cook? Come <laughs> home from work, have to look after the children, cook a meal, wash their dishes. I said, gosh, I'll go crazy. <laughs> so I value, I value having somebody to help me. I, I value my domestic staff very highly. I, I'm very grateful to my family. My family have been amazingly supportive, particularly when the children were younger. My husband is very supportive. He, he's the first, my first reader. When I write a story, the first person to read it <laughs> is my husband. He's super supportive. Aww. So I'm grateful. I, and there's God's grace. So I would say the number one thing if you're trying to juggle a number of things, it's not, perhaps people do it alone successfully, but I could not have. I, I need help. <laughs> well, <laughs> it's <so> okay <laughs> to have help. I mean, we are in a society where people want to measure their strength mm -hmm. and, and effort and successes with struggling. Mm -hmm. When it comes to women, they want mm -hmm. to sort of equate the amount of struggle you have mm -hmm. to success. Mm -hmm. You know, if you have six children and you're carrying things, then you're very successful. <laughs> but then it's okay to have help. The essence of yes. working hard yes. is to make things easier yes. with time. Yes. And I'm very happy that you mentioned that yes. first. Yes. So God's grace, apart from um, having the zeal mm -hmm. and doing what you're passionate about, mm -hmm. because I'm sure if you were not really, really into the writing, then the <laughs> night where you were thinking, oh, I'm tired, should I write? Probably wouldn't have been mm -hmm. able to go mm -hmm. on. Mm -hmm. So... I can tell is the passion there, yeah. right? Yeah. And then you have a supportive family, yes. a supportive um, husband yes. and family. Mm -hmm. You also have the help, domestic yes. staff, honestly. and God's <laughs> grace. Honestly, honestly. I mean, the lady I have at home now, oh God, she's such a, she's a dream cook, <laughs> a dream cook. And I, I don't know how I would have coped without her. Mm -hmm. Well, if you are with us here on The Real Show Live on Metro mm -hmm. TV Ghana, we are telling you, my guest, Madam Elizabeth Irene Beatty is saying it is okay to have help and you should also have a supportive family, a supportive partner and do what you're passionate about, right? So that you can keep going. Okay, so some nuggets or something to inspire people watching you. Maybe if you could go back 10 years, 20 years, what do you wish you would have known by then? There's a lot I wish I would have known. I I think I would focus quite strongly on making sure, particularly with work, or particularly with trying to achieve an aim, mm -hmm. I would say make sure you have the right people around you. That's, that's really key. The people around you, the skill sets they bring to you, the encouragement they bring to you is critical. So make sure you're looking around you and making sure you have the right people around you, those who will help you move in the direction that you want to go. It is, it is critical. I, mean, I would, I would um, go back to um, writing The Twelve Hearts, for example. Okay. My, it, it came at a time when I had 
a, a number of crises to juggle with. My husband was unwell, my hard, my hard drive crashed, so I lost everything on, on the story, and I felt I couldn't write it again. But my dad kept telling me, oh, you know, what about that story you were writing? And I said, you know, there's too much going on right now. I, I probably i am not going to write it. And he kept saying, I said, was, I've lost it. I lost my hard drive. It crashed. And he kept saying, what do you mean you've lost it? It wasn't it in your head before <laughs> I put it. I said, yes, it was. And just my dad going on and on about that made me realize, you know, yes, it's in my head. Let me write the story. And I wrote the story, and it's gone on to sell so many copies, lots and lots of copies. So that's just a little example of making sure you have people around you who will encourage you, people who will motivate you, people you can look up to as well. That's important. If all the people around you are people who have much lower aspirations than you are, than you do, unconsciously that might affect you as well. Yes. And there's nothing wrong with having a mix of people around you. But I think, because you also need to pull people along, yes. but you must make sure that while you're pulling people along, you have somebody to look at who will help you raise your game as well. I think that's what I would say. Don't try not to be too content with the status quo. Yeah. Be hungry. There's nothing wrong with contentment. It's a good thing, and I don't want to send out a mixed signal. Contentment is great, but contentment, the desire to grow, and that growth will be affected by the people in your circle. So I would say to young people, make sure that you've got some people there who will stimulate you to grow. Mm -hmm. Wow. <laughs> I do not want to end the segment. <laughs> but um, do you have plans of probably uh, something, doing something about mentorship, mentoring I, people? Yes, I actually have taken part in a number of mentorship okay. programs. But I think mentorship is it's an ongoing thing. And very often the mentorship can be informal. I've realized that in situations where you have a, 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 a mentorship program that is laid out, you're invited to meet a particular young lady, you might find that the relationship breaks along the, while, al along the way. However, within our own circles, we always have people who need your help, who need your encouragement, who need your guidance. So yes, I believe strongly in helping somebody who desires to grow whether it's in terms of, particularly with writing, I get a lot of requests from young people who have an interest in that. So yes, I believe in mentorship, and while I may not always be involved in a formal mentorship program, a large part of what I do is talking to people, giving them advice, sharing my story with them, just so they know how I got to this point, and they can use that as some sort of support for themselves as well. Mentorship is key, whether it's formal or informal. Mm -hmm. Wow, I have had a great evening and I hope you have, and well, I know you have, and if you missed any part of tonight's episode, you have missed too much. So make sure that you catch up on our Facebook Live at The Real Show or tomorrow's repeats at 8.30 right here on Metro TV Ghana. This is The Real Show and my guest is Madam Elizabeth Irene Beatty. She is a director at Patholab and she is an awesome Arthur. She taught us a lot this evening. Let me go through a few of them so that you have something to, you know, spend the night with. So God's grace, moving with your passion, it's okay to have help and a supportive uh, system is very important. Take care of yourself. Your cardiovascular strength and health is very important. Check your lifestyle and you and I have so much that we can do. So let's have the zeal. It's okay to be content, but contentment with growth. This is The Real Show. I love my hair. It's from The Hair Highness on Instagram. You can check them out. My makeup is my MB Studio Fix. And as usual, I have a great production team. Thank you to all of you for sticking with me throughout this segment. Mm -hmm.